see. Welcome everyone. I see that people are coming into the room joining us today. I'm going to give it a moment to let everybody into the room. But welcome. Let me do a quick screen share. As you guys come on in today, for those of you who are new, who've never been here before, we welcome you. For those that have come to our Teen Science Cafes in the past, it's so good to have you all back. It's a new year. We have started up again. Um, so what we love for you to do is in the chat box, which you'll find the chat box, it's a, um, at the bottom of your screen if you hover your mouse, you'll see there is a, a menu and one of your options is the chat box. If you open that up and make sure you select all panelists and attendees and let us know your first name and where you are coming from today. Because I know that we get folks not just from Vermont, but from other parts of the country. So it'd be great to see who's with us. Adrian from Rhode Island. I love Rhode Island. That's where I went to college. And Emily's with us from New Hampshire and Brenna and Jack and Lexi all from Vermont. It's great. I'm starting to recognize some of the names. I know some of you are back with us, who, those of you who joined us in the spring and summer. So welcome everyone. We have folks from Missouri. That's great. And um, Sandgate, I don't know where that is. Um, Oliver, what state is Sandgate in? Um, so welcome everybody. I am gonna put in the chat box if anybody needs our live captioning services, we have someone that's gonna be live captioning for us today. And I just put that chat, uh, that link into the chat box. So if you do need live captioning, just click on that link and that will take you to the live captioning. So I would like to review the protocols that we have for when we gather um, at our teen science cafes, when we gather in Zoom land. All of you today are muted. Um, you actually don't have the ability to speak and none of you are on video except for myself and our presenter. So the way that you are going to engage are two ways. We're gonna be using the chat box just like we are right now and we're gonna be using the Q&A box and we use them differently. The chat box is going to be used for when our presenter will ask you questions, um, might wanna know your thoughts, um, you might wanna share thoughts with one another, um, but it's used to be on topic. The Q&A box is used to ask our presenter questions. So if you have a, present, a question specifically for our presenter today, you would put that into the Q&A box. And the cool thing about the Q&A box is if someone asked a question that you were gonna ask, or maybe just a question that you liked, you can click on the thumbs up and it will upvote the question so that we know that a lot of people are interested in it. But don't worry, we really make a very um, concerted effort to answer every question that gets asked because we know your questions are really important and you're here to learn and we wanna make sure your questions get answered. So we ask that you just be courteous and respectful of one another today. Um, just please don't create any distractions. And the only way that that can happen in this um, space is with the chat box. So again, just please use the chat box appropriately. Stay engaged, participate. I know today's topic is gonna be really cool. So looking forward to that. So before we move on to today's presentation, I just do wanna let you all know that there's a lot of really great programs coming through UVM Extension for each program this fall. You can see some of them um, on the screen. So the Science Cafes today is the first in a series that is gonna go all year. So we have a schedule built out until December 16th, but we're gonna start back up in January too. So. Um, hopefully you'll join us every week um, for a different topic and, and just learn some really great science. If you wanna learn how to code, we have a program starting in October that you can learn how to code. And we're, we're doing this in partnership with Ohio. So it's also a cool way to have an exchange with another state. There's the Youth Environmental Summit, as well as an opportunity to become a teen teacher with our Try for the Environment program. And those are just four programs. There's so many more. So you can go to this website listed at the bottom of the screen 
and check out all the amazing opportunities that are available to you this fall. Um, you can always reach out to me if you have any questions. So our topic today is mitigating climate change in electrical engineering. And our presenter is Professor Mad Almasalki. Hey, everyone. <laughs> Hi, Mad. I'm going to just quickly read Mad's bio. My phone shut off on me, so I just have to open it up. So just a little bit about um, our presenter today. So Professor Al Masalki is an assistant professor in the Department of Electrical and Biomedical Engineering at the University of Vermont. He's also the director of Vermont's new Center for Sustainable, Resilient, and Autonomous Systems. And he is the co-founder of a tech startup called Packetized Energy. His research interests lie at the intersection of power systems, mathematical optimization, and controls and focus on improving responsiveness and resilience of power systems. So prior to joining um, University of Vermont, he received his PhD from the University of Michigan in electrical engineering systems um, in 2013. And then he has an undergraduate degree in electrical engineering and applied mathematics from the University of Cincinnati in Ohio. So I would like to welcome our presenter today. And uh, I know we all look forward to just learning a lot about your topic today. So welcome. Thank you um, so much, Lauren. And thank you everyone for coming. Um, I can't imagine anything more important than hanging out on Zoom when you are a uh, 18. So I appreciate your effort and also your time. And hopefully we'll talk about something fun today. Well, hopefully it'll be fun to you guys, because I certainly enjoy it. Um, and so with the introduction, um, and please feel free to post questions at any given time. Um, I have blocked my own video, so I can't see myself, but I don't need to see myself. Okay, hopefully you can see my background. And so I just want to quickly go through my background, because at some point I was like you. I was a student in some middle school, in some high school, and at some point in college. And I'll just give you a brief background of myself uh, and some key lessons that lead to some fun uh, events, which includes learning. Um, so I grew up in Copenhagen, Denmark. I came to the US um, in 2000, and I basically have been in school ever since. Um, so I completed my bachelor's in electrical engineering and mathematics in Cincinnati. Uh, it was really fun because I got to actually work in the field. So it's a five-year program, but I got to do a co-op, uh, which means I worked and went to school uh, basically back and forth each semester. That's a great way to reduce student debt. Um, um, then I went to grad school in Michigan. So I went to the other state. Uh, so if you're from Ohio, you know you shouldn't go to Michigan, but I did it anyways. Um, and it was a really, really fun experience. I got to you know hang out with robots um, and also other humans. Um, then after Michigan, I didn't go to academia immediately. I didn't become a professor right after my PhD. I actually joined a startup company that also worked in the area of energy. And that really tickled my, my uh, interest for energy and specifically the role that software and other technologies could play in making energy more efficient, more, co more cost effective, uh, and really help bring about more renewables, uh, which I think is a key component of any climate mitigation policy. Uh, and then I joined or moved to Vermont. Um, this is my first time ever in the Northeast. Um, and I moved to Vermont um, and I've been working with the US Department of Energy um, basically ever since. And I've also co-founded a company called Packetized Energy. Uh, we are also based out of um, Burlington, Vermont. And now I'm here presenting to you all. So it just gets better and better. Um, but, you know, there, there are lots of lessons when so I'm 37 years old, I've, I've been around for a little bit. And I've certainly learned a lot of really good things. And so the one thing I definitely want you guys to know is that, you know, where you are today, you can probably do more than you already know. So what you learn in school is not the only thing you can do. And so what that means is as you tinker with tools and tinker with toys and, and learn things on your own, you can learn far more from doing than just reading a textbook sometimes. And so uh, this was definitely one of the first lessons that I learned because when I worked in the field, uh, during school, I actually learned the school material before taking the classes. And so you are really taking a big component of, of, of learning to do before you know by taking part in these um, seminars and, and really learning on your own. 
And I think someone else would agree with me that that's an important lesson. Uh, so the future Nobel Prize winner, Greta Thunberg, uh, who is my Scandinavian colleague, um, she also stated that it's there's so incredibly much you can do and not underestimate yourself. And so I think she was 17 when she started causing all kinds of good trouble. Um, and so when I was a student, uh, I took a lot of classes uh, because I really believed that by taking classes, I could learn a lot of things. And I, I ended up tinkering too little. And so what I want to take, one key thing I really want to emphasize to you all is, you know, tinker, break things, uh, and try to understand why they break. And I heard that, uh, Lauren, you mentioned this Learn to Code program. So one of the yes. things I've learned in, in the last couple of years has really been that software is critical. Um, Software is everywhere, right? And the thermostat we use and our watches uh, used to be Google Glass, uh, Google Glasses uh, that had software in them. Software is critical. So learning to code is fantastic and taking advantage of these learn to code programs is a really great start. Um, and so I got to work in a company called Edigent during my undergraduate and that's where I learned to code. Uh, and I hadn't taken any classes really on formal coding. Uh, and so the company Edigent really taught me a bunch of, of really valuable um, lessons on coding, algorithms, uh, machine learning. It was a really fun experience, it had nothing to do with power and energy, it had nothing to do with climate. Um, and so the other thing I learned was, you know, even though I didn't spend any time taking classes on power systems, I didn't know about energy systems much at all in undergraduate. Um, but what I do know is that you're constant, everything is changing and you have to learn to adapt. And so here's a picture of me growing up in Denmark. Um, if you look at my shirt, so I'm the one on the left. My brother is the one on the right. If you look at my shirt, it says Michigan University. There's no such thing as Michigan University. And if you remember where I went to grad school, I went to grad school at the University of Michigan. And so it's really weird, you know, growing up and looking through these text, these photo albums, and I suddenly see myself with a Michigan University shirt on, and I ended up going to the University of Michigan. Uh, so, you know, you can't plan for everything. You certainly, I couldn't plan for going to Michigan University because it didn't exist. Um, so that was a really, you know, just, just be ready to adapt because that's constantly happening, even with the environment and the climate. Uh, the other thing that you can't plan for are pop quizzes. And so, you know, let's take a little break. And, and before we get into matters, um, just one general question that's worth asking um, anyone interested in engineering is what is the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century, maybe according to the National Academy of, of Science? So you guys can put your answers in the chat and we'll just start reading them out. So Oliver, so Oliver says, says the internet, uh, Desmond computers, Alexander going to the moon. Those are very cute. I like Who them too. Gonna play Maya space travel. Yep. There's always a slight delay. So we know you're typing. So we'll give you guys a moment. Finn the says internet. the internet, www. The World Wide Web. Uh, Anna says electricity. Okay. Okay, I, I like where Anna is going. I, I, <laughs> I would agree with that statement, I think, now. It's computers. So, right, so what power? Oh. So renewable oh, energies and light bulbs, electrification. Hey, somebody has good skills. <laughs> All right. I just lost audio for a second here. Okay, I'm back. Okay, you back there. Okay, so why you were slightly out, uh, Catalina said technology. Okay, good. So let's and so we there, have hydropower. <laughs> there's a lot of excellent answers. So I'll give you yes. one hint. To, let's narrow this down. So the machine that I'm talking about spans an entire continent. I'll give another hint. You use it every day. I guess that would make the internet and computers also work. Oh. Oh, now we're getting power grid, internet. Okay, so let's maybe let's say that Crawford and Maya, I think you guys hit the nail on the head. So the National Academy of Engineering said that electrification was the greatest engineering achievement of the 20th century, right? So that's, that's 20 years ago, that was a great achievement. Um, and the reason is that electrification is what powers our economies, our healthcare systems, our computers, our World Wide Web. Without electricity, we really cannot function very well. And you can see this, this is a picture taken from space of the Earth in many different segments. 
And you can just see that life is electricity. You can't be without it. Our cities, our towns, and our neighborhoods are all powered. And so they really made up, electricity really made up a fundamental building block for the humanity in the 20th, in the 20th century. Um, of course, you know, that also means that I have to include pictures from the 20th century, which are basically what does electrification look like? And so you and I and all of us are sitting in our homes and we're powered from some pole top transformer sitting outside or in our neighborhood. If you were lucky, it's underground so that you don't have to see these poles. And then if you, you know, trace back these wires that dangle from wooden pole to wooden pole, you'll get these transformer stations. You'll get these big towers, these transmission towers. And then you get these high voltage systems and you can trace it all the way back to some power plant really, really, really far away. And all of this is enabled by a fantastic battle that happened about 140 years ago. So I'm not gonna go into all the history, but I will certainly share with you um, some, some really key players when it comes to electrification. So this is going back to the 1880s. Uh, so I certainly wasn't alive when none of us were, but you know, I'm sure you've all heard of Nikola Tesla, maybe. You can just put it into the chat and say yes. Um, so that's a lot of miles of electricity. You should put that into the Q&A box and we'll answer that later. Um, Thomas Edison, have you heard of him? Okay, good. All right, so you've all heard of Thomas Edison, right? You all know what he looks like because that is not the person on the left. So the person on the left is actually Westinghouse. Um, so that was a trick I played on you all. Um, and if you look at Thomas Edison's name, I also misspelled it so that we will never forget what Thomas Edison did. So if you look at Thomas Edison, it's spelled with a DC, because that was what he did. He invented, he basically worked with direct current systems, DC systems. And Nikola Tesla, I put an AC in there because he worked on AC systems. And the difference between AC and systems and DC system is really, one is a straight line, one directional, and the other one is a wave that goes to back and forth, back and forth. So one is direct and one is alternating. So the Tesla is the AC alternating current, Edison is the DC current. The reason they're important is that they really, those two entities together with Westinghouse, who is also important, really laid the foundation for that electric system we have today. And the fact that we can turn on light bulbs without worrying about um, whether they will work or not, at least in the US. And so I don't want to go all through all the details. You can read this beautiful Netflix uh, documentaries, but really the difference between the two people were that Thomas Edison was a businessman, a brilliant uh, inventor, and really founded the Silicon Valley of its day in New Jersey. Nikola Tesla was one of the smartest people ever. Um, he was a visionary, but not a businessman. And so he dealt, developed AC power. Thomas Edison invested all his effort and all his money in DC power, and they basically got head to what's it called butted heads because Tom Edison, Edison needed a problem solved in DC power that Nikola Tesla said you needed AC power for. So imagine you built a whole garden of green flowers or red flowers and someone comes and tells you that having blue flowers is a good thing. Uh, you've just put all this effort into your, your red flowers and you're not gonna just switch everything to blue flowers. And so, you know, the infrastructure was built by Edison and Nikola Tesla came and told him that you're not gonna be able to do better unless you switch to AC. In the end, it's very famous because Nikola Tesla died at 86 or something like this. And he was very poor at the time of his death. Whereas Thomas Edison was given a public parade akin to a presidential uh, funeral. So these two people basically had equal contributions to where we are today, but had very different endings. Maybe another lesson would be that you should take some business classes, maybe be aware of economics. Uh, it's a good topic to know besides coding. Um, so basically uh, what happened was that um, Edison had his DC power. He invested in the system. He was selling light bulbs like they were Tesla cars in the 1880s. These were luxury items, right? Not everyone could afford a light bulb. And so you had these areas in New York City in Manhattan where people were installing these light bulbs. And as light bulbs become more and more popular, Edison couldn't supply them with power. And so he couldn't transmit his DC power long enough distances. And so he needed more and more of these generating stations. And what happened was Edison hired Tesla to solve this problem, to say, I don't want these DC power stations everywhere. I just want one DC power station. So can you please help me build one? And Tesla says, cool, but you need AC power, not DC power. 
And so Tesla left the Silicon Valley of, of the US at the time in Menlo Park, New Jersey, to build polyphase AC power with Mr. Westinghouse. So the reason you see these three lines outside your pole-top transformers is because Tesla said and showed that three-phase AC power systems were superior to DC, and they were. So just to conclude our electrification history lesson before we jump into some of the fun discussions on climate and engineering, just summarizing here that AC power won, uh, mainly because Edison was very stuck in his ways. He wanted DC to, to be fixed, and Westinghouse basically came in and around with a superior technology. Um, the reason AC power won was because when you have voltage AC power, you can transform it up and down at different transmission levels, different voltage levels, and that allows you to do long distance transmission. When you have long distance transmission, you can build very large power plants far away from the population and send that power to the population so they can all light their light bulbs. Large stations means you have economies of scale, which means you have good business models. And so in the end, transformers were what made AC power win out because DC power doesn't have these transformers. Um, you can say the rest is history, um, but if you really want, nothing is ever done. So if you're really interested in DC power and AC power, I'm certainly happy. Ah, that's good. Maya, I don't know if AC and DC power have anything to do with AC, DC, but I wouldn't be, I think it actually is names. I think these are abbreviations of two people's names but I don't know that one. But if you wanted to look up more about you know, DC power is not dead because new technologies come. And so power electronics has come in and played a big role in what's called DC microgrids and high voltage DC megagrids. So that's a very exciting topic that people are working on these days. So DC power is coming back, uh, but AC power is still the dominant force for power systems. And so when you look out and you see these buckets, those are transformers. If you drive by a substation with lots of cool stuff, those are large substation transformers. They're very expensive, very big and very fancy. Anyways, so electrification is key to where we are today. It's also key, well, and I'll argue this in my thesis, it's also key to where we're going, specifically when it centers on climate change, specifically as it's centered on green economies or green deals. And so you know, just to give you a highlight, um, if you look at the US green economy, it's really growing rapidly. Uh, and so in the US recently, you know, trillions of dollars of sales revenue, millions of jobs supported in what's called the green economy, which is environmental, anything associated with environmental, low carbon or renewable energy activities. And so green economy is growing, but unfortunately so are our climate challenges. And so I, I'm sure all of you are, assume most of you are pretty well aware that these climate challenges aren't just a a, a blib in, in, in our existence, but it really are a force coming forth. Uh, and so you can see here's a picture from the federal government showing how month to month and going upwards year to year, the number of billion dollar disasters in the US are increasing. Um, and so when I put together these slides, they're very depressing. And so you can look here in 2017, Puerto Rico was basically wiped off the map temporarily electricity, no electricity for months. Uh, Pakistan in 2018 saw world heat records broken. Uh, these records were of course broken in 2020. Um, in 2019 was a, what was it? Um, these were enormous fires. I think was these in Australia, California, saw enormous fires. And then 2020, it just never ends. And so we're seeing, you know, wildfires in California coloring our skies red. Uh, we have Hurricane Laura, not Lauren, you're okay, uh, um, leveling cities. You have the hottest temperature ever recorded on earth in Death Valley. Go ahead, Lauren. I was gonna say, and today Hurricane Sally is That's right. the south as we speak. That's right, yep. And so I just went on Twitter to see what else might be going on. And of course, a hurricane is hitting a major, you know, area of the US. So there's just no letdown in 2020. Uh, I think the top in California, the top five, out of the top 10 fires in California's history, five of them happened this year. So we are at a point where we really have to be aggressive about fighting climate change. And one way to do it, which I'll propose today, is to really think about climate change mitigation technologies 
that are offered in power, from power systems and, and you know, by corollary in electric, electrical engineering. And so what we need and what I'll present here is that there are solutions. So all this dire news, there are solutions to do it. Uh, and what I believe is that if they work, they will help mitigate climate change and that will matter. And so solutions that matter when they work are really important. And the Department of Energy agrees on this. And so if you look at kind of the, it's called the United Nations Environmental Program, um, they have an emissions gap report that's quite interesting and has really nice pictures too. And so if you look at the global emissions in the world, so this red dot here is the actual emissions in 2018 and 19 with an upward trend. So we are around here. If we want to bring global warming to below 2%, we need to hit net zero emissions by 2100. And so you can see this red line is where we need to go. Where we're going is this red arrow, this red oval is pointing us upwards. Business as usual is not gonna be a good outcome, right? 2021, 2022, 2050 will not be pretty pictures. Um, and so the solution to this, the United Nations agrees, requires massive terawatt scale renewable integration. This means lots of solar, lots of wind, lots of zero carbon power. That includes nuclear power as well, even though it's very expensive. But solar and wind are really key. And if you want to integrate lots of solar and wind, you're gonna put them on the electric grid. It's gonna be a huge challenge. The reason it'll be a huge challenge is because when you have power systems, uh, the number one most important thing about power systems or el electric systems is that when you have demand and you have generation, they have to match all the time, right? So when I go over, which I'll do now, and I'll turn off my lights. That has an effect on the grid in, in North America, right? Switching lights on or off has an effect. Um, it's a very small effect, but it is an effect, right? It affects the frequency on our system, a very, 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 very small amount. If my light bulb was a stadium of lights, that has a bigger effect. And so every time the demand changes, which is us humans, every time we use the system, generation has to adapt. But what if generation is solar and wind? Or what if our uh, demand is suddenly different than light bulbs? Maybe it's a bunch of electric vehicles, right? So having this balance is very important. Power systems is built on having this balance, controlling this balance. And so if we can be smart about how we manage our demand, we can allow for generation that maybe we cannot control directly. So solar and wind, for example. And I'll get into this in a bit. The key concept, again, just remember, demand has to equal supply or generation. So this means we have a challenge, which is managing demand. And the other challenge is that, uh, so when you have a challenge, you also have an opportunity. And so this cartoon has always been humorous to me because when you meet people talking about power systems 20 years ago, they were not as fun. Uh, and this time I go to any birthday party with my kids, and the parents will come and talk about solar panels and so electric vehicle chargers and so these things are they are real um, there are real opportunities here and so if you zoom in so i want to just highlight this this portion here if you zoom into the united nations report what they show is that the emission reductions that we can have so how much you can reduce emissions by come from different sectors a big portion of it comes from the energy sector this is solar and wind Another big portion comes from transportation. These are electrical vehicles. Agriculture needs to basically be electrified. And so we're looking at all these industries and the key pieces we can take away is that a lot of them run on fossil fuels. If we electrify them and we put more solar and wind on the system, we can clean up a lot of emissions. Um, if we can make demand flexible, we can basically help this balance between supply and demand. And so people are predicting that flexible demand will increase from today, which is like 59 gigawatts. And I'll, we'll get to the question of what is a gigawatt. Um, we'll move towards 200 gigawatts, right? So we'll go from 60 to 200. That's a huge increase. And this is by 2030 in 10 years. 200 gigawatts of flexible demand is millions of smart devices. What do you think controls these devices? I'll give, I'll give a minute now, we'll do a minute. What do you think controls all these devices that are supposed to help with flexible demand to make devices smarter? 
So you guys Earlier pop I... in your thoughts into the chat box and we know there's always a delay. So type in, we'll see what comes up. Yeah. So we need millions of devices. So soft, Desmond says we need software. That's right. Yep. You need connectivity. You need the internet. You need some way of talking to the devices. That's right. So software, the internet, <clears throat> funding. Oh, yes, that's good. Funding is good. <laughs> Anna, that is very astute. You can't do anything without money. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Is is Anna's parents perhaps academics? I don't know. <laughs> or venture capitalists. It could be one of those two. Um, but when you have millions of devices, they have to connect. They have to talk. Have oh good. Um, but they also need the the devices themselves have to have sensing capabilities, right? They need sensors. So you need tiny cheap sensors. You need connectivity. And you need software. That's what makes these devices possible. Um, when it comes to funding, Anna said funding. And so United Nations, again, this is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. The IPCC has this in their, in their write-ups, in their reports. Huge investments are predicted in the area of energy system investments. So supply-side energy system investments, generation allocation and solar will see trillion dollar investments per year going forward, right? So not only do we have a potential solution and flexible demand, but the opportunity is enormous, right? So if you're getting into coding, you're getting into learning about cool sensors, uh, if you get into electrical engineering, the opportunity to contribute to, to climate change is enormous. We, we are, if we are moved aside as a society and a planet, to move towards climate change mitigation, electrical engineering will be a big part of it because you need software, sensing, smart devices, and you need power systems. Uh, and, and many climate technology startup companies agree. So this slide here shows a lot of companies that are tagged as climate technology startups by investors. So this is Shail Khan. He's is a fairly influential investor at the Energy Impact Partners out of New York City. Um, and if you look in the upper right corner, you can see packetized energy is actually listed on their on their uh, sheet as a pack climate technology startup. And we are located in Burlington, uh, Vermont. So we're very proud to be included in this chart by Shail Khan. Um, so these companies exist. They don't have to be Google and Apple, right? Even small individuals can do it. All right, I'm gonna take a small breather now. I've, I've poured content on you. And I mentioned Terawatt a couple of times ago. Um, and also mentioned gigawatts. And so it's just a, let's just pause for a second. And can we talk about what is um, a terawatt? And so I listed a bunch of options. Feel free to post them into the chat window. Uh, what is a terawatt? Giga is a billion. Okay. So what's what's a tera? Okay. Good. So which one of these are a trillion? So David says all of the above. Crawford gives me a lot of zeros. <laughs> Some have chosen the first. It looks like it's all over the map uh, for answers. <laughs> uh, Anna says it's a unit of measurement. Yes, okay. but which, yes. Which, which one of these answers do you think it is? Number one, yep. You can go, yeah, if you could do yeah. the bullets, one, two, three, four, that's right. five, six, it might be easier to type in. Yeah, so this is, that's true. I should have labeled them so they're easy. That's okay. So a trillion watts, this is true. A terawatt is a trillion watts. It's this one. The first one. That's right. But a billion kilowatts is also a trillion watts because a kilowatt is a thousand watts. A million megawatts is also a terawatt. And a thousand gigawatts are also a terawatt. So it is all of the above, actually. Um, nice. And so the obvious question becomes well, if you ask me, what is a terawatt? It's so much power that I don't know what, I don't actually know what it is. Like, I can't tell you that it's a nuclear power plant because it's not. Right? A nuclear power plant is roughly a gigawatt. So There's a thousand nuclear power plants. That's a lot. So a better question is what is a kilowatt hour? Right? Kilowatt hour, unlike terawatt, so terawatt is power, a kilowatt hour is energy. So how much energy is a kilowatt hour, a single kilowatt hour? If you go look at your parents' electric bills or your own electric bills, um, you can look at a kilowatt hour. You get charged for kilowatt hours from the utility. 
So if you were to look at these bullets, which I should have labeled again, um, how much do you think a kilowatt hour is in terms of energy? That is right. That's what, that is what we pay the electric company for. All of the above. Number three, one, two, three, light and no LED light bulb for 100 hours. Yep. Yep. Charge an electric vehicle 15 minutes. Yep. So these are all examples of what a kilowatt hour is. And so you can see, you can do many different things with a kilowatt hour. Um, three miles in an electric car, you can charge your electric car for 15 minutes, roughly, under normal charging conditions. Um, you can also light an LED light bulb for 100 hours, or you can do, conduct 3 million Google searches. So these are, you know, most people, even educated people who've gone to college, usually don't know what a kilowatt hour is because it's such a amorphous thing. You don't, you just do it. You just turn on light bulbs. You don't think about it. Electricity is easy to use, so you don't think about it. Um, but that's a big component of my research is actually also to teach people through games what is a kilowatt hour. So I've worked with students on actually designing games, but that's a different, that's a different game, game, a different day. Uh, but also software is a big part of that. All right. So we know what a terawatt, terawatt is. It's a trillion watts or a billion kilowatts. We know that a kilowatt hour is a kilowatt for one hour. Uh, and that's a lot of different things. So now we can go back and talk about these devices, right? So to have smart devices, you need cheap sensors. And so what's amazing is that for the last 10 years, so if you are 17 now, when you were seven, the cost of sensors, which is what's in our watches, I guess since it's not a watch, it's a Fitbit. In your Fitbit, in your Google Watch, or whatever watch you have, whatever thermostats you have, whatever fun little toys you buy, those sensors have dropped by more than 90% in cost in the last 10 years, right? So it used to cost $100 for something. Now it's 10 bucks. And when you have a $10 chip, you can put it inside a, a device and you can make those devices smart with software. And you can put those devices and make other things smarter. So this piece on the right here is actually packetized energy's own water, smart water heater retrofit. So you can take this device and put it on top of your electric water heater and make it smart. So we have a number of projects in Vermont and across the US turning dumb water heaters into smart water heaters so that the demand and the consumption is flexible. Um, anyways, that would not have been possible 10 years ago. It was simply too expensive. And uh, one fun aside, if you go back and look at literature, when people talked about making water heaters smart, it used to cost $60,000 40 years ago. So a $60,000 device 40 years ago is $10 chip you can buy on Amazon with free shipping. So it's really amazing like how cheap these things are. And when they're cheap, they're everywhere, which is what ubiquitous means. What this means is that suddenly all these smart devices I have, I can make cheap, right? I can put them together. I can make them into a, act like a battery, for example, right? 10,000 water heaters will act like a big battery. And so I can actually construct flexible demand from water heaters or smart thermostats or air conditioners or electric vehicles. I can coordinate them and manage them. And I can do it at a lower cost than just buying a big battery uh, and put it on the grid itself. And in addition to that, when you manage demand, you don't have to build batteries. And batteries have hidden costs like cobalt mining, which is quite uh, inhumane. As, as a source of, of a resource. So not only is it today possible to build these devices, it's actually cheaper to operate and manage than batteries themselves for the same flexibility. Um, the only difference with demand side flexibility, right? If I'm managing your water heater, if I'm managing Lauren's water heater, if I don't do a good job, Lauren will end up with lots of cold showers and then I get a phone call and we don't want phone calls because we have to respect the human that's in the loop, right? So if you're managing smart demand, you have to manage um, the human that's operating that device. So if you go to a battery, of course, nobody's going to use that battery on the grid because you bought it for the grid, but it's very expensive. And so you run into this problem. So in Boston, they call it the Fenway Frank problem. In Ireland, it's the two pint problem. And in Vermont, I'm going to denote it the creamy conundrum. Um, and it really is the fact that if I ask every one of you to go around and, and, and let's go make your demand flexible or let's go make your demand, your energy usage more efficient, you will save maybe five, maybe $10 a month at best, right? $5 is pretty good. 
right? Five dollars is pretty good, but five dollars a month, like if you have a how many hours for babysitting is five dollars a month? It's like one hour, half an hour babysitting. Are you willing to spend every day trying to tune your light bulb fixtures for five dollars a month? I don't think so. Evidence says you do not. And what people are also showing is that you know when you manage these smart energy systems, you do have to take into people into account people's feelings comfort because people are very quick at overriding uh, events right they're very quick at basically saying okay i'm done i'm uncomfortable i will no longer play your game and so there are lots of of people who have shown with research that when you manage people's devices if you do a bad job people notice very quickly and so within 30 minute minutes you can lose half of your people in a program from a two degree fahrenheit change in your set point Right, so if I decide to change Lauren's water heater temperature, if she notices, you get maybe one try, maybe you get it you know, after that, she'll just quit, which makes sense because five dollars a month is not worth a cold shower. Right, the price of a cold shower is more than five dollars a month. And so you really have this problem that energy is cheap, people have requirements, and so you need to embed these requirements into any coordination, which is hard. Right, so it's called quality of service. And so just to summarize some of the challenges we're dealing with. So the 20th century, uh, there's lots more content, but um, we have time, good. Uh, so in the 21st century was the greatest invention, engineering achievement of the 20th century was the electricity. In that electric grid, supply followed demand. So as we changed our light bulbs, the grid followed us, right? We had large generators, and I'll show those in a bit. We had very little renewables, that's changing. Renewables are coming. Now demand we're starting to control because sensors are cheap and software is doable. The internet is good, we have cloud computing. And there's a bunch of new technologies coming in that allow us to do more with less. And so human operators in the grid are starting to scratch their head and they're like, oh, I knew how to do it in the 20th century, but in the 21st century, I'm in trouble because I don't have that gut feeling anymore, right? It's a lot harder to balance the grid than it used to be because the system is becoming complex, which again means they need better software tools, right? Learn how to code, it's very important. Anyway, so now what I want to do now is just go through what makes up a power system and how our flexible demand fits into this place. And Lauren, you should tell me if, if we're running out of time. Um, you are doing great. Good, good. So a big bulk, part of the power system is what's called thermal generation. This is your coal plants, your gas, and your nuclear power plants. You can kind of think of them like a huge knob. You can change it, but not very quickly, right? That's the thermal generation, these big steam entities, steam locomotives you can think of. Now we have solar. Solar are like these small knobs sitting on people's roofs. They are very quick, you can move them because when a cloud comes in, it doesn't shine brightly, right? Clouds interfere with solar, PV solar. From day to day, this is in New York. So this is data from New York State uh, down near New York City. You can see here that over three days, you get very different amounts of solar at different times of the day. So this is of course noon, noon, and noon. And what do you think happens here? This is a nighttime, of course. All right, so this is when we're sleeping, there's no solar. I know how to predict that. So. We definitely can't control when the sun shines, and we just take what we get. Let's look at wind. Wind is, again, slightly larger knobs than solar, but they can also move very quickly. Um, in addition, if you look at, at this plot here, what this shows is that this is what people use, this is how people use energy over a summer week in green, and the blue is when the wind is blowing. Using the chat window, can you post some of your thoughts? What, what are you seeing here as the difference between these two? What's different between green and blue? So with solar, we know that at night there's nothing, there's no solar power at night. But what's happening with wind? There's too much supply, green is smoother, yep. So people, so this is, it. This is people in Texas. Ah. This, so what this represents is all of Texas when they use power. So when you have lots of people together, ah, they're out of phase. So Greg said out of phase. Yep, 
So lots of people in Texas using power looks like a looks like a sinusoid, right? Almost, basically. Uh, but the wind being produced is out of phase, out of sync with the demand. So what does that mean? That means that when I produce the most wind is when I don't need it the most. And so it's not super useful. So if you could somehow shift, how would you shift? How would you put it in phase or in sync with the green? So how can you shift blue to be in sync with the green? Wind is less reliable, that's right because it's not very smooth, it's jackety. Uh, so you can't count on it. Day to day, it's different, just like solar. How would you shift? Oh, good. So Anna says store power. Yep. Put them out to the sea, Adrian. Maybe Adrian is aware. Rhode Island, maybe. Uh, offshore wind is a big deal. It's more constant. That's right. Um, so Anna says store the power. So that's right. So you could take big batteries, and you can then store the wind power from the night and use it in the day. Absolutely correct. What if you could store, what if you could change the demand so that more of it is resulted overnight? Right? Run your dishwasher at night, charge your electric vehicles at night, cool your house down during the nighttime so that it's cooler and can sustain things during the day. So what if you can shift demand ever so slightly? So both of those are feasible solutions, but we never can control when the wind blows. That's definitely not an option. Um, and so as you integrate more and more solar and wind, what happens is you, know, you take your wind and you take your demand and you subtract them out and you get what actually your big knobs have to deal with, your thermal generators have to deal with. And so what you see here is called the California duck curve. Um, so this is, this is for different years, average demand in California. So this is how much people consume in California. What do you think is happening, everyone? What do you think is happening in the middle of the day? Why is the demand dipping down in the middle of the day? People are at work and school. That's right. So, so if you look at 2012, so the gray line here represents 2012, 2013, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So actually in 2017, we actually exceeded these numbers. So these are our predictions. <clears throat> so California is actually down here. In the middle of the day, the total demand that is seen on the grid is down here. So people are saying air conditioners, people are working, but it actually is because people have installed solar on their roof. And so in the middle of the day in California, the sun shines. And when you have a sunny day in California and the sun shines, what looks like a normal working day when people are not home suddenly looks like a lot less power. So people are consuming a lot less power because you're pumping solar power back onto the grid. So all of these houses with solar on it are basically supplying their neighbors, even though nobody's home. Or when people are home using power, that's what's happening. So your so solar power is basically pushing the demand down, down, down. If it makes it to zero, we're in trouble because that means you have to turn off all your big knob on the power systems. All the generators have to be off because we're supplying less and less demand. And what that means is that from noon when the sun shines the most to the afternoon when the sun goes down, you have a huge swing in power. And that ramp, so this curve is called the duck curve. It's a very famous topic in power systems. And so this ramp is a real problem because you have to get these big knobs to ramp up and you have to do so quickly, right? So you have three hours to ramp up thousands and thousands of megawatts. And that is just very difficult. So this, these problems are hitting California. Actually, you can see it in the news these days. Uh, there's just too much renewables in California and their big old knobs have trouble adapting to it. We think Vermont is a, uh, we don't think of Vermont as a sunny state, but Vermont is seeing exactly the same behavior. People are installing solar panels on the roofs. Utilities are installing solar panels in the fields. And so what's happening in Vermont, and this is actual data in Vermont, what you're seeing is that on an overcast day in 2018 with lots of clouds and no solar, we're up here, right? This beautiful purple, curve is a normal day without solar. Every day since 2015 has been pushing the Vermont demand down. Right? We're at pretty low levels, right? So we peak at around 700, 800 uh, in, the, in the day, in the mornings, in the evenings. But in the middle of the day, we're down to 450 and 2020 is even lower. 
right? So in Vermont, we have what we call the CHAMP curve. And so what we're really seeing is that solar is having a big effect on our system. So the question becomes, with all this solar and all this wind, we have to push onto the system to solve the climate challenge, right? We need terawatts of solar and wind. We have gigawatts today. How are we going to get there? How do we balance the variability? So one option is to get more of these big knob generators that can move faster. Actually, these should be say more, get faster uh, natural gas generators. Another option is control the weather. C is coordinate the load and D is install big batteries. I'm disappointed that no one says control the weather. They're Vermonters, they know you can't control the weather. Right, <laughs> or actually right. not everyone's on is a Vermonter, but I'm sure yeah. every state has a saying, you know, the that's weather right, will right. change in five minutes. That's right. Yep. And the forecast is always wrong. Oh. That's right. So controlling the weather would be fantastic. So we need to call in some, you know, some X-men or X-women to come help us with that. But it, it really is, you know, this is not an option under a climate mitigation plan, right? You want to cure climate change, you don't put more natural gas generators into the field. You can't control the weather. Oops. So the options that are left are install big batteries, which are expensive, or coordinate loads, which is hard. And so what I'll present now is just a short video I've made. Um, I didn't personally make it, but I designed it with some people that are more creative than me. Um, and so I'll present this video and hopefully you can hear it. Uh, it's about two minutes long. And so the, the answer will be C and D, and the question will be how much of each. Right? One is cheaper than the other and one is harder than the other. So. I'll play the video and hopefully you can hear me. And if you can't hear it, I'll be quiet. Every day, we use a lot of energy. Conventional thermal generators provide a reliable electric supply. However, they release harmful emissions into our environment. In contrast, renewable energy sources are much better for the environment, but the supply is inherently uncertain and variable. National laboratory and industry experts estimate that today's electric grid cannot support more than 30% of our energy coming from renewables. The variability means getting to 50%, 70%, or 100% renewable energy poses a great challenge, but also a huge opportunity. A part of the solution is on the demand side. Products such as smart water heaters, electric vehicles, and heating and cooling systems, known as distributed energy resources, can be aggregated into what is called a virtual battery or virtual power plant and be controlled to provide the grid with responsive resources that can help smoothen the impact from renewables, reduce the need for conventional thermal generation, and enable a much deeper penetration of renewable energy. But the DERs are subject to complex human needs, such as hot water usage, driving patterns, and air conditioning preferences. Therefore, to best coordinate DERs, we must develop next-generation algorithms for optimally controlling virtual batteries across the grid. This requires state-of-the-art advances in optimization theory and real-time control systems. In our research group, we work with students and collaborators, federal and industry partners, to study the optimal dispatch and control of virtual batteries and grids subject to forecasted but uncertain renewables. This requires predictive models of the grid and virtual batteries, optimization under uncertainty, and real-time sensing and control. Our research enables the development of scalable algorithms for a reliable, sustainable, and affordable energy future. For more information, follow us on Twitter and visit us online. All right, so basically this video summarizes um, what we've just talked about and how we use resources to do create flexible demand to then absorb all this variability from renewables so that we can have more and more renewables and less and less fossil fuels on our electric grid. And we know that the electric grid is basically the foundation of our economies, healthcare systems, everything we do. And so the electric grid is really foundational to climate change. And so as we talk about coordinating demand, I think it's important to think about what kind of loads or what kind of devices do we need to manage. And so I'll have a list here. Um, if you can think of other devices, I'm always happy to hear um, um, and learn what you guys have seen, or maybe you have some good ideas about some devices I've left out. So 
number one that we hear about is thermostats. So the Google Nest, Honeywell, Ecobee, there are so many smart thermostats these days that have cheap sensors, cool software, connectivity from the internet, all part of the solution when you buy it in the store. Um, so Greg, put that question in the Q&A and I'll, I'll answer it. Um, water heaters, right? So this is a retrofit solution you put on top of the water heater. These are not drawn to scale, right? So this retrofit is not bigger than the water heater itself. Uh, electric vehicles, uh, so I, um, I'm sure you've seen them. Recently, I've seen an enormous number of Teslas. Um, I don't know why that is, but just recently noticed it. Uh, batteries, oh, I forgot, electric vehicles. Have you heard of the Cybertruck by Tesla? <coughs> so the Cybertruck, um, oh, a fun comparison. Electric vehicles, when they charge, are the equivalent of eight refrigerators. The power system, so that when the, the utility built, was not designed so that every household has eight refrigerators capacity. So if everyone had an electric vehicle, this, the grid would literally shut down. You cannot handle that much demand. And so a normal electric vehicle is, you can think of it like eight refrigerators, right? Every time I see an electric vehicle, I'm like eight refrigerators. The Cybertruck, which is Tesla's newest gadget, um, the Cybertruck is more like 80 refrigerators. Uh, 80 refrigerators will take down a city's power system. Uh, it's just a lot, all at once. And so I, I don't know how they're gonna manage this. They're gonna need specialized infrastructure. So my recommendation to all of you is do not buy a Cybertruck without the utility's permission, at least in the short term. Uh, they're just, the, I think the level of charging is 250 kilowatts. The normal level of charging here for a normal vehicle is between 10 and 20 kilowatts, uh, which is again, eight refrigerators, 80 refrigerators. Uh, they do look kind of cool, but uh, you'll have to live in the car after the electricity breaks, like the grid will break. All right, the other option is batteries. There are lots of cool options. They're just very expensive. Um, about $10,000 for each of these items here. The end phase is, is funny. It's built like uh, Legos. So you can take a bunch of smaller pieces and put them together any way you want. But roughly $10,000 is the entry level for a battery. Uh, washer and dryer, I skipped, I don't know why, but I just don't think I found a cool picture of an electric uh, smart water heater. Heat pumps, um, if you've heard of heat pumps or mini splits, uh, I was in Spain two years ago, one year ago. I don't remember when I was in Spain because COVID happened and 2020 has taken a decade away from me. But when I was in Spain, I saw these balconies and these facades just covered and littered with these devices. These are all heat pumps, which is pretty cool. Uh, but there's also lots of flexible demand. Um, and smart home. So my wife recently bought a Echo, what's it called, Amos? No, Google Echo, Google Echo, Google's, what's that called? Google devices, whatever it's called. Alexa, that's right. No, that's Amazon. You guys are tricking me. Uh, so there's Google, there's Amazon, and there's Apple Siri. Google Dot. Yep. Echo Dot. It's an Echo. Okay. Okay. I thought I was just hearing myself over and over, but it was the Echo. All right. So there's a bunch of smart homes. These smart homes can also help coordinate devices, right? Because they're aware of what's going on in the house. They actually spy a little bit on us because they know which, where we are and when we're home. And so they could inform devices of, you know, when is a good time to heat up the water in a water tank. And so the idea is that if you take a bunch of these smart devices, you take some batteries, you take your electric vehicles, you take all these smart devices you have, your heat pumps, your solar panels, these homes that you have, have flexibility to offer. And so if you have a bunch of homes, you can control these homes. So the question is, if you had a million devices, how do we control them? So if I asked you to control a million devices, Clearly you need software, clearly you need connectivity. We need cheap sensors, we know that. I propose a million armed robot octopus. I think that would be the best way of controlling a million devices. Um, it's kind of like an overlord. You just build it over our head and, and just sit and has a hand in every single household with a camera to know when we're home. I think that would work. Maybe it's expensive, maybe it's slightly privacy invasive, 
but I think it will work. Um, another option, so this is a little bit on the, on the this is third or fourth year electrical engineering side. Um, you could design a controller where you take in all the measurements from all the devices, control them, and it spit out control signals to all these devices. So that's called a millionth order system. That's super hard to do. Um, I don't recommend this. This is just very difficult. You're gonna need a very powerful computer. Um, another option is you get a really powerful radar or a radio signal, and you broadcast device signals to devices. Right? That's actually pretty cheap. That's how your radio in your car works. Um, there's just certain challenges with broadcasting. Uh, so, like if, when you listen to the radio in your car, if you change the channel people who provide the broadcast don't know. And so when you broadcast to devices, you're kind of like on a megaphone, you're screaming at devices on what to do, but you don't really know what they're doing. So, it, so it, there's a certain, it's not super controllable. Uh, so it's hard to deal with. The other option is to do things smarter. Um, and so I'll skip to the fifth one. So one option is that you assign a priority to each device, right? Imagine if you knew all the priorities. So if I know that Lauren is not home, I can turn off her water heater. It shouldn't be on. Um, and if, as Lauren comes home, I use this Google, the Google Home to basically tell me that this water heater has a higher priority now because the occupant is home. So you can assign priorities and, and rank those. They're just hard to do in real time. The other option is to make the devices smarter. So option five, if you make all the devices smart enough to know their own priority and their own energy need, you can make the devices communicate only when they have something to offer. And so instead of all the devices always telling you, oh, I need priority, oh, I'm not that important, oh, I'm very important, have the devices only tell you when they can do something good. And so that reduces the amount of communications you need. It removes, makes everything very simple because every device is essentially saying when they have a packet to offer, a packet of flexibility. So that's right, so on-demand water heaters. And so if you look at, at systems in Vermont, um, so this actually, this is real power. There's about 2,000 water heaters in Vermont that we have data for. Um, and so what you can see here is that in the morning, people take showers. So you see a little bump in the morning. And then what, GM, what the Green Mountain Power does, the utility, what they do is they turn off all of these water heaters for three hours during the day to prevent them from turning on to basically keep power low. And then at, after three hours, they say, okay, you are allowed to be normal again, water heaters again. And when that happens, all the water heaters are cold because three hours without heating turns water cold. And so they all switch on, Boop, they all jump on and you get this huge spike, it's called the cold snap. And then over time, the power comes down. But that snap is, that's risky, right? 2000 devices can do this, 2 million devices will be way off the screen. So this is through FM radio broadcast. You can basically just broadcast out an off signal that turns off all the devices. And then after three hours, you broadcast again, a go back to normal mode and they just switch into normal operations. It's basically just a, a FM radio controlled relay. That's how it's done. That was to Maya's question. Okay, so we can really do a lot better than this. Um, we can do much better than just a sprinkler basically, which is what they're doing. Um, and so this is called non, it has a certain name. This is what I work on. I work on this a lot. And so we borrow ideas. <clears throat> Managing devices. It's kind of like, instead of telling them what to do, have the devices tell you what to do. So when you send an email or when you share data on your phone, oh, you can't see my phone because it's invisible. Oh, there it is. If you share data on your, uh, what's it called? phone, on your computer, on your laptop, on your tablet, on your phone, I guess, on your, I guess your, uh, what's it called? Wristband watch. Regardless of what file it is, whether it's a picture, an SMS, a video or GIF, a meme, an Instagram post, the data you're sending from your phone to the cloud or to the internet is shipped in a bunch of small data packets. And so the idea at UVM is what we're working on is what's called packetized energy management. Is where you take a water heater's demand and you chop it up into small pieces. And the, the water heater then tells you when it needs a small packet of energy. And so we also use what is used to control and data on the internet, right? So 
what manages data flow on the internet can actually be adapted for managing power flows on the grid. And so that packetization and randomization are key elements of what makes the internet work. And we're also trying to adapt this to make um, demand management work for the grid. And so I've already mentioned that this broadcasting of, of data, good, good, okay. So we'll cut maybe two minutes, five minutes, three minutes. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. And so there really are two key methods used today. One is what's called the broadcast based method where people scream at a microphone. That's not, that, that's me. They use my megaphones basically. Use megaphones to tell devices to jump or not jump. Like I mentioned earlier, if you broadcast out stuff, it's really hard to know what's happening unless you have what's called feedback. If you have feedback that requires you to measure all the devices and send that data all the way back up to the cloud, super expensive. And so it's really hard to distinguish individuals in these scenarios and it's really hard to know who's doing what without expensive feedback being shipped back to the cloud. Right? So megaphones are great at telling devices what to do, not so good at listening. Uh, that's also a good lesson. My wife tells me I should listen better. Um, so the other option is let the devices speak to you, right? So instead of having a megaphone, have a big ear. And as the devices talk to you, listen. And if you just listen, it doesn't matter if the device is speaking, uh, well, okay, assuming that you can code the devices to speak a certain language, all you have to do is listen for that language. And so it doesn't matter if it's your phone speaking internet or your computer speaking internet or your water heater or your air conditioner or your electric vehicle all speaking in the same language, packetized energy in this case. And if all the devices are speaking the same language, it doesn't matter what they are, it doesn't matter what kind of file they're representing, we know how to deal with them. And so we can schedule these devices really, really quickly. And what that allows us to do, and I've, I'm skipping a lot of details and I probably should have skipped this as well, um, but really the listening component is really important because if you get devices to speak a certain language, and you just listen to that language, you can do really well. And so I'll, what that allows us to do is you can think of demand coordination really as the balance between, it allows you to balance supply and demand. And so here's an example of what that would look like. And so supply and demand is like the force. We are the, the force that balances everything. You have Jedi's and Siths. And to give you a simple illustration of what this looks like, uh, take a water heater. It heats up a lot. You can chop it up into small bits. These are the packets. You can then have the device know when it needs a packet or not by telling you when it needs a packet. So it makes a request. And it, all you have to do is manage these requests. That's actually pretty easy. Uh, because if you listen to the devices coming in, you can say yes or no, maybe based on how the sun shines or the wind blows. Right? If you have lots of renewables, you just line up your available packets as they come with your available weather based resources that you can't control. And so we've done this. So what, did mean, what this means is that your supply and demand will look something like this under packetized energy management. Without coordination, this is what it would look like. These red packets are actually violating the supply you have. You can't meet them. So they're not gonna be met. These are cold showers. By using packetized energy management and this randomization, which means you're listening to the devices and you're filling the holes as you come in, you can really shape the demand so that afterwards they meet your supply. You're controlling demand just like you would a power plant, except these are really small knobs. So you're choreographing all these devices in real time. And so we've built a lab at UVM. We have a test bed where you can basically test these algorithms out and you can show that 5,000 simulated water heaters can actually do quite a bit of flexibility. And so here on the x-axis, you see the hot on the left, these are temperatures on the bottom. So this is cold and hot. This is a histogram of all the devices and their temperatures. And what you'll see is that now we'll track a signal here that could be a solar supply signal. So lots of solar, not so much of solar. And we can actually line up our water heaters to consume all of the solar we have. And you can see this here. The blue line is what we want. The red line is what we're doing. And you can see here that we're tracking this blue signal all by keeping the water heaters within their temperature limit, so nobody gets a cold shower. So this has won a couple of awards, this, this research, we have a number of papers and the Department of Energy has really been strong supporters of this technology. Uh, and we've developed this all at UVM, which has been really fun experience. 
And so I'm wrapping up now, Lauren, I promise. Um, and so really what I want to highlight with this talk is really that engineering technology will help make the grid more responsive. I could maybe say electrical engineering technology is key because we're talking about coding, sensors, communications, connectivity, power systems, electricity. Um, and really you have more renewables, terawatts of renewables, less emissions, climate will be unchanged, which is fantastic. Um, greater flexibility means lower costs, right? So you can do this economically and you can actually improve the grid operations altogether, but that's a different topic. So you get less blackouts, more reliable systems. Completing this research is not done, but this represents really a holy grail in power systems. So if you're familiar with Indiana Jones, you're familiar with the holy grail. It's very hard to get and it's guarded by a bunch of old white people, which is pretty true in power systems. Uh, and so we need to change that as well. And the reason you can change that is because there are lots of young people coming through and interested in energy. And I think sometimes they misplace that electrical engineering is this old white people sport. And, and it's really not true. Um, and so what's really wonderful and amazing and another amazing opportunity is that a large portion of the workforce today is retiring. All right, so in the next 10 years, we're gonna to need to replace a number of seasoned veterans in the field. And so there's huge opportunity for employment, huge opportunity for scholarships, um, to people wanting to study energy or electricity systems. And so I, hopefully today I presented a view of electrical engineering that is broader than just the circuits in which we've studied in historical sense, and really broader than electrical engineering, really broader than just electrification. Uh, that was great. I'm going to ask if you just leave this slide up while we take questions. Um, yes, so let's people do have that. To, but before we go into questions, you guys, I'm going to launch a quick poll. We always do this at all of our cafes. There's two questions just to get your feedback on today's cafe. So I'm launching the poll right now. Just quickly take it and then we're going to go into the questions that you all have put into the Q&A box. So if for some reason you don't see the poll, you can just type your answer into the chat. Um, but I don't want to spend too long on this. I'm going to let it so that most of you have voted. And thank you all. I can see the numbers popping up. And then we will go into the Q and A. As I see, there's like 20 questions, which is awesome. You guys have been great audience today. Let's get a few more of you into the poll before I close it out. Let's see, some of you haven't taken it. Just quickly go do that. Gonna give it 10 more seconds. All right, I'm gonna close out the poll. Thank you guys for that. And let's go into the Q&A box um, and let's get your questions answered. So the first question, how many miles are there of electricity cables in the world? Do you know? So I don't know how many miles there are, but I can maybe tell you that each mile of high voltage transmission cable. So when you drive along highways, you'll usually see the transmission towers. Each mile costs about a million dollars to build. So I don't know how many miles there are. There are lots of miles. Um, I should, could have included a picture here of the transmission network in the US, but there's a lot. There's lots and lots and lots of miles. Maybe ask Alexa, right? <laughs> That's true. Yes. <laughs> hey Siri, how many miles of electricity cables are there in the US? Okay, I found this on the web for how many miles of electricity cables are there in the US. Check it out. So I'm seeing 200,000 is, is a number. <laughs> 200,000 miles of high voltage and five and a half million miles of local distribution lines. So wow. five million miles of electricity cables, uh, the high voltage one, so 200,000 miles, each of those is a million to two million each. So that's, that's expensive. It's a lot of money invested in electricity systems. Uh, Maya asks, how can we change? How do we move forward to where we are, convert to green energy? That's right. So I think the, so the United Nations, um, I think they really lay it out. I really am a big fan of this report the, the emissions gap report. And so I think they're coming out with a new version shortly, every three years, I think. So this is, in my mind, these are really the key technologies we need to develop. 
Um, and there's lots of fantastic companies and startup companies pushing out these technologies. So the first one is con conventional abatement, Maya. Um, that's really wind solar, but also some new nuclear technologies, new batteries, new, new energy um, requirements, um, hardware, basically new energy hardware. The other ones are um, technologies that basically remove carbon from the atmosphere. So carbon sequestration is the top is a technology that's quite popular these days. Um, and so, so I think these key pieces here are important technologies to consider going forward as a society. As an individual, the best thing an individual can do is insulate your house. Uh, so improve energy efficiency, insulate your pipes, insulate your house, it's super cheap and it has a really big payback. Yes. So, so Catalina asks, uh, why did they go down? And I think, Catalina, you might need to put into the chat box what you're referencing. This says, why did they go down? And we'll go off to another question um, and have you um, mm -hmm. give a little bit more uh, explanation around that question. We have two um, connected. Um, Desmond asks, do you think that cold fusion power will ever happen? Also, if it does, will it become the number one power source? And related, um, will cold fusion happen in your opinion? Will it provide enough power? So that's so cold fusion. Um, thank you, Desmond. It's been around for a long time. So I remember when I was a student in middle school or something like this, I was reading popular science and cold fusion was mentioned in there. I was so excited. I wanted to study nuclear engineering. I don't think it has changed since I was in middle school. Um, it just, it doesn't, I'm not a physicist. I will not bet on, on whether it's working or not. I just have not seen any changes in bringing anything to market in any near future. So I, I would say that it's probably not gonna happen. And it's not gonna be cost competitive with solar and wind is my bet. Um, but, you know, 20 years from now, things will change. And if it helps with carbon emissions, yeah. Let's see what it can do. Okay, I think this next one was already answered when Maya asked, I was wondering why you were talking about the band ACDC, because Maya asked, does AC and DC power have anything to do with the naming of the band ACDC? <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think it does. I think it's initials of the folks who are singing, but uh, it, it is beyond my expertise. So ACDC was what my cousin listened to when I was little. Um, I never listened to them myself. I'll ask my husband, he would know, but he's not home right now. Uh, so Maya, I can get back to you on that. Um, was AC power only used for light bulbs at that time? Oh, so, so at the time, in the 1880s, it was only DC power for light bulbs. So in the 1880s until the 1890s, it was just DC power everywhere. Everything was run on DC power, which means all the light bulbs. And they replaced gas and, and oil burning candles. Um, so it was actually a, clean energy source. Um, so yes, it was just DC, not AC. AC came um, in the 1890s with Westinghouse. And I'm not sure if you all see in the chat, Anna f did find out that ACDC was actually named um, because one of the mm. band sister saw the initials on a sewing machine and it is connected to electricity. Awesome. Yeah, Good. very cool. Now we know. Now we know. So now we need, to, uh, we need to get a song from them that we can use as a theme song. That's right. Um, we have a question that just says, why in 2011 so high? But I don't know what that's referencing. So if you wrote that question, maybe you can come back in and, oh, yeah. billion dollar disasters. Oh, I'm trying to, let me get back to it. Oh, there's been a doo -doo -doo -doo. all right. Um, hmm. lost my mouse here for a moment. Um, so why is 2011 so high? It's a probably a statistical anomaly. Um, I think the key point is here the trends have really increased significantly over historical averages in black. Um, the last couple of years have been really rough on the climate, or the climate has been really rough on us, I guess. 
So next question, is the next hurricane going to be Tito? Um, it does go alphabetical. I don't, do you know if Tito's the, they always pick the names ahead of time and you can find that out. I think it's actually Teddy. I think Teddy's already named right. out into the Atlantic. But it, it only goes till S, right? Or S T now, uh, R Q. At some point, it's going to switch. W, I think it only goes to W. That's right. And then it, That's right. Yeah. It switches to Greek, and then after yeah. that, it switches to Greek. Yeah. And yep. they're going to use it up this year because there's already um, enough storms out in the Atlantic right now that it's going to complete that. Yeah. So, so we're going to. You guys can right. Google that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it'll go to Greek, and then after Greek, it goes to boy names. That's what I. Uh, that's what I've been told. Yeah, I think there's a whole system. If you guys go to the National Weather Service, they would yep. explain it. Um, next question, um, are we going to be able to equal generation with load? Is that possible? So that's, that's a really good question. Um, so when you look at the balance between demand and generation, so the system, the power system is built to always nudge one towards the other specifically generation towards demand and as long as they're very very close everything works beautifully um your question is does it ever actually match exactly all the time it doesn't well the electricity always matches exactly but the frequency is not always 60 hertz it's almost never 60 hertz it's always oscillating around 60 hertz and that's because balancing exactly is really hard but the electricity is always balanced every millisecond of the grid the electricity between demand and supply is always matched exactly. And that's the beauty of electricity. Um, how it's done, I'm happy to discuss in more detail, but it has to do with electromagnetic fields. It has to do with large generators providing, basically storing electricity or energy in electromagnetic fields. And then as you switch on your light bulb, you're actually tapping those electric fields and converting it into electricity. And that happens in real time, milli milliseconds, um, so they are actually always balanced. So electricity is always balanced. The grid frequency does jump up and down though. Um, do you know how much solar panels cost? So if you are an individual, they're basically a dollar per watt. If you are a utility, it's, so if you're a utility, a large commercial entity, it's about a third of that, 40 cents or 30 cents per watt. Uh, so residential is, is the most expensive. A dollar a watt is pretty, it's a pretty good investment. In Vermont, if you were to invest in putting solar on your roof, assuming a new roof, you'll get a payback in seven to 10 years on your electric bill. So it's, that's not, not a bad investment. So instead of spending money on a new on-demand water heating system, could you just make a program or buy a unit that makes your normal water heater into yeah. a smart one? So Declan, I think that's, a, that's an important topic. Um, new smart devices are actually expensive. Um, so like a fancy water heater, a smart water heater is like $1,000. A dumb water heater is three, $400. And so there's a pretty big jump in price. And, and so if you want to retrofit it, you can get a retrofit for like 150. Um, Yes, you can absolutely. Most programs are around retrofitting existing units because they last about five to 10 years. And so waiting for five to 10 years for people to switch is, we don't have time for that, I think. So Greg wants to know, is the grid robust enough to balance loads across regions? Yep. Yeah, so this, um, so there are different regions in power systems. So, you know, there's the, your utility itself, which have to manage demand which is maybe your city or maybe Burlington is your city. In Vermont, it's probably Green Mountain Power. Between states, there are different entities. They're called system operators and they look at more the transmission level. Um, you can manage demand within your north, let's say within the northeast, you can certainly manage uh, the demand robustly. If you were to take millions and millions of devices between different areas, uh, they might, those devices might respond to different signals. So you might want to group those devices based on the region they're in. So that's a good question. Um, so Oliver is asking, could you sell the plant's metal to buy batteries and then put them where the plants were? Yeah, 
Oh, okay. So you're talking about power plants, probably uh, the metal in the power plants and buy batteries and put them where the plants were. Uh, so there's the what's it called? The Yankee, the 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 nuclear power plant of Vermont. I had heard rumors that they might put batteries down there instead of the nuclear power plant. Yeah. So batteries are expensive, um, in part because of rare metals that you can't get in instead of the power plant. Uh, could you sell the plant's metal to buy batteries and then put them where the plants were? So there, there are certainly places where they are replacing power plants with solar pa panels, for example, or wind turbines. Uh, so because the electricity infrastructure is already there, so you can just put something else on there that has a lot of power, that would work too. Um, fun, completely side fact, in Texas to have a building full of essentially incandescent light bulbs or resistors at like a megawatt. So it's just insane. They have a whole building full of resistors and they use it to, for rare cases to manage the grid. Anyways, that made me think of it. Uh, um, next vehicles? question is, are electric vehicles even possible in rural areas? And before um, I let Mads answer this, I'll just fun fact, 20 years ago when I was in grad school, I was actually part of a project here in Vermont to answer that very question and did my master's thesis on how to introduce electric vehicles oh, into fine. the marketplace. So the, the study showed how even back then when batteries were not even to what the batteries are today, that electric vehicles could meet most people's needs, even in you know where we travel larger distances and in the cold temperatures. So that was 20 years ago, you could, and it's now the technology is even better. So I guess, in, I guess I could interpret this in two ways. So EVs, are they possible in rural areas from a consumer perspective? The answer is I would agree with Lauren, totally yes. Um, electric vehicles have become really hardened. Um, and the other thing is from a grid perspective, the rural grid is usually weaker than a, a, a um, uh, what's it called, a urban grid so that it's, an electric vehicle in an urban grid would have a bigger effect on that grid than electric vehicle in an uh, an electric vehicle in a rural grid would have a larger effect on the grid than an electric vehicle in the urban grid. And so there are certain challenges with electric vehicle charging in rural areas um, that need to be handled more carefully, but the utilities there are pretty good. So we've, we've worked with Vermont Electric Co-op uh, who are managing this carefully. Yep. Yep. Okay, yep. so um, we're getting to that. I'm going to ask that please no one put any more questions in. We're just going to wrap up what we have. So Declan asks, have you heard of hybrid hot water heaters? They run for like half an hour and then they don't run for the rest of the day. So are, there are many different types of water heaters, Declan. Um, so hybrid, is it power? Is it heated by solar power? Is that what makes it hybrid? Or is it heated by a heat pump? So the, there are different, there are heat pump water heaters, which could be considered hybrid. And then there are solar heated water he heaters as well. just wrote in solar. Ah, yes. Yep. There's a solar power, solar heated water heaters uh, are quite interesting um, because they rely on the sun. So as long as the sun shines, I think you're good. Yep. Um, they're, they're very efficient, which is good. Could you describe microgrids? Um, so the neighborhood I'm in, we have, there are maybe seven or 10 or 12 houses. Um, if we decided, all of us, that we don't want to pay the utility bill anymore, we could all start to get solar and batteries. And then we could go out to the street and cut off that main entry into our neighborhood. If you cut off the utility from your grid, you suddenly have a little itty bitty grid that represents a bunch of households connected to each other. A little grid that is, can sustain its own generation, sorry, a little grid with generation that can sustain its own demand, it's called a microgrid. How big it is, um, in some cases, it could be the size of a city microgrid, a army base, a campus, or even a neighborhood, or even in some cases, individual households or a commercial building like apartment building. Okay, Catalina, I think has, she has multiple questions and I, I'm gonna guess that they're all connected. 
doesn't more technology mean more power usage? And how do you make that ramp go down? Isn't that bad? Isn't yep. it too fast of a difference? And won't the data get disturbed? And Catalina, if um, those don't go together, just in the chat, um, help us out. But I was assuming all your questions kind of went together. Yeah. So these are so so that you know, Catalina, your question that's a that's also a really good question. Um, there's been a lot of good questions today, and so it's a very astute observation that all I've mentioned so far has been that sensors have gotten cheaper and therefore they become ubiquitous. What I didn't mention was the sensors have also become energy efficient. And so when we talk about retrofitting a water heater, for example, we're talking about devices that use milliwatts, really, really like hundreds of a watt or thousands of a watt compared to a water heater that uses 5,000 watts. So it's a, it's, it is true that more sensors or more computers do consume more power. Uh, computing consumes power, but it is such a small amount relative to what we are controlling. And so what Catalina is also hinting at is, you know, if I wanted to manage my, if I wanted to add a retrofit for charging my iPhone here, uh, the charger for an iPhone, I think is five watts. A water heater is 5,000 watts. And so if you were to build devices for an iPhone retrofit charger or something like this, energy efficiency becomes really important. And so, yes, um, you do have to consider the whole system. It is not just the individual devices, it is the whole system. But so far, we're not dealing with small, you know, watt scale devices. We're dealing with kilowatt devices, a thousand watt devices. Good question. Yeah, so that was our last question. You guys asked amazing questions. Um, Garrett, I see you're asking about the recording. We do record. I'll be posting this um, later. And I can, um, I know many of you wanted the link to the video in today's presentation and I can send out both that link and a link to the recording to everybody who attended. So thank you all for just being fantastic participants today, asking amazing questions. I hope that you'll all come back um, next week for our session. It's gonna be on Sharky Science. Uh, there's a UVM professor who does uh, research on sharks and other ocean um, um, the creatures. So um, let's all thank Mads for his time today and really helping us understand uh, this topic. So thank you so much and we look forward to seeing everyone again next week. Thank you all.